Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Young Kim. I'm from Biomedical Engineering. I'm an associate head for research. Uh, our interim head, Nan Kong, is traveling, so I'm uh, got to privilege to introduce our proud Professor uh, Luis Solorio. Um, this is actually my uh, admiration uh, for uh, Professor Solorio. Professor Solorio is a veteran. Um, started his college after his service. Actually, um, uh, he served the U.S. Army in uh, South Korea. Actually, uh, there are multiple U.S. Army uh, bases, military bases in South Korea. So he served there um, until uh, 2001. Actually, he uh, finished uh, his service with the rank of sergeant. So uh, Sergeant uh, Ruiz uh, Solorio. And, um, and then he pursues higher education. Um, so he went to uh, St. Louis University got a uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry and uh, master's studies in um, uh, Rensselaer Polytech IPI uh, 2007 and then a PhD in uh, biomedical engineering in uh, University of uh, Michigan. And then he went on um, the uh, postdoctoral training in radiology in Case Western. I'm sorry, actually, you Oops. got the uh, PhD <laughs> from uh, Case Western and then I uh, went to a, a postdoctoral training for uh, University of Michigan uh, in chemical engineering. So actually, he studies from uh, uh, applications of ultrasound imaging and then move on to more engineering uh, of uh, cancer microbiology, uh, microenvironment. So actually, he's the expert um, in the tissue engineering and drug delivery, actually uh, in using uh, engineering principles to apply some uh, cancer and tumor biology and microenvironment. Uh, Professor Solorio received numerous awards and recognitions, including um, NIH, uh, National Institute of Cancer, uh, Independence, um, Pathway to Independence Award, K99, as you know, the getting um, NCI in particular funding is extremely competitive, um, and also uh, Chowalta Trust Young Investigator Award. Uh, Metavir Early Career Award, Mark Foundation uh, Aspire Award. And uh, actually, he is a really good teacher. Um, during our uh, COVID-19 season, actually, some of the students actually emailed the provost to just thank him uh, for his uh, dedication uh, to our students. So uh, to, from an excellent researcher to an uh, excellent teacher. Um, and one thing is that researcher, they, um, the key respect I really uh, respect is this. Actually, he's the example of a resilient researcher and actually really want to uh, implement this culture uh, in our unit as well uh, as a good example of the persistent pursue will be paid off. Actually, he's in a really competitive research area, cancer, cancer biology, tissue engineering, but he's doing really good. So I'm happy to uh, introduce him um, to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Young, for the, the wonderful introduction. And also, I would like to thank uh, everyone for one make, sticking around. Because I know after your, your personal uh, your person comes, it's, it's probably pretty inviting to just want to head out. And so thanks for sticking around for the full thing. Also, I want to thank the organizers. You've done a fantastic job. One, making sure that we're prepared for this. And then two, uh, just keeping us on schedule because you have a lot of professors here talking. And that is very much not an easy task to do. And so uh, what, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, ultimately we'll get into the research. We'll see if we have time. I might fly through that because a lot of it, it's hard to get into the details of it because it's not so much an engineering approach. It's, it's really truly a biomedical engineering approach. So to understand the engineering we're doing, you really have to understand the biology as well. And so it makes it kind of deep and, and a little difficult to get into in just a couple minutes. Uh, and so uh, what, I what I wanted to start with was just thinking about why I came to Purdue uh, at the end of the day. And I, you know, I have a cynical answer, and that's that my wife got a job at Cook. And so I, I was an easy uh, uh, spousal hire. But, uh, the, but really what the real answer is, is uh, it was the collaborative environment. And so I, I've been at a, a number of different institutions, a number of different places. And um, the, 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 the true nature of our collaborations here are just, I really think, second to none. Like, you can go anywhere else in the world, and I just don't feel like you have the same sort of environment that you had here. And that's really what pulled me here at the end of the day. And then, again, if you're thinking about the journey and the trip, none of it is possible without students. And so 
I would have not gotten nowhere <laughs> at all without having an excellent cohort of students. And you can see they've all gone on to do really wonderful things. A lot of them have ended up in pharma. Uh, I have a, an outstanding student, Sarah Libring, who uh, was the first recipient of the F99 here at Purdue. And so that's a transition award from a graduate student and a postdoc. Uh, and she's well on her way to <laughs> us trying to hire her as a faculty here in the near future. Um, Brian June, uh, now at the Los Alamos National Lab. So we, we just have a number of students that have done really, really well. And then I've also had a number of really good uh, master students who have also continued and, and progressed projects that, are, that I would never have even dreamed of starting without them. And then uh, beyond that, uh, again, that collaborative environment, just at Purdue alone, I have a whole host of collaborators that I, I work with, I talk to on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, now, beyond those past students, I have a very strong cohort of current students who are really pushing all of our projects forward and they're making huge advancements every single day. Uh, Friday lab meetings are the absolute highlight of my week. And so I look forward to getting the opportunity to hear what they've been up to all the time and see how much uh, they've advanced things over the course of the, the week to month that they've been working on these different projects. Uh, and beyond that, I've had a host of wonderful mentors throughout my career. Uh, starting with Jan Stegman, who was my master's uh, research advisor, uh, who put up with a lot of my naivete with, <laughs> with basic experimental design and, uh, and, and helped rein me in when I was way too ambitious for things. Uh, and then Agata Exner, my PhD advisor, fantastic human being, really set the, the course of my career tra trajectory, uh, as well as Jörg Lahan and Gary Luker, who were my postdoc research advisors. And once I uh, left, you know, that training environment, it was, uh, I had the misfortune, or I mean, the fortune of being next to Dave Umulus. So he was, uh, his office was right next to mine, and I, and I never, and it, and it turns out that the walls are very thin in MJS. And so I knew exactly when Dave was in his office or not, because I heard every word of his conversation. And so because of that, we became quick friends because I knew exactly when his meetings ended and we would go to lunch. And so I would just walk across. And so Dave uh, has always been really wonderful. Uh, it just given me general life advice, uh, advice with career. So while not my official faculty mentor, he was just a true and wonderful mentor throughout my career. Uh, Keenan Park, who uh, again, an absolute fantastic human being. Uh, uh, I, I had the, the privilege of teaching my very first class with Keenan. And Keenam uh, is just a truly, ex I mean, world-class researcher, bar none. But beyond that, I think a lot of people don't understand just how excellent of a teacher he is. And so having the opportunity to sit into a classroom and watching an absolute master of work uh, was really instrumental in, in me learning how to teach. Because up to that point, you know, I'd, I'd uh, taught the occasional lecture, but I never ran a course. But seeing Keenam do it, I really learned the ins and outs. And then uh, last, even though uh, Mike at the time, he'd uh, been hired here uh, just a few years before I was, he uh, kind of helped me navigate some of the early stages of tenure process. And again, a, a, a very close friend and collaborator. And so with that, I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself and about that journey. So like a lot of us here, my path couldn't have not have been uh, more nonlinear. So I started off, uh, I was born in Anaheim, California. And uh, my, my dad is from Michoacan, Mexico. My uh, mom is from Orange County. And so they lived in Anaheim. And so uh, when I was a kid, we used to spend a lot of time in Disneyland. And then uh, they decided to up and move to the middle of nowhere in Missouri. <laughs> and, so, and so I went from uh, going on rides on the Madden Horde bobsled to riding ATVs in the woods. <laughs> and so uh, different kinds of rides, different kinds of adventures, but it, there was uh, absolutely nothing there except for woods and woods. And so uh, I actually started to learn uh, that I really liked being outdoors, uh, really liked that environment, did a lot of camping. And I wish I could say I was a model student. I wish I could say I was a valedictorian. I wish I could say that I was 100% focused on my classes. I wish I could say that uh, I was really focused and just great at time management. But I would be lying to you. I was none of those things. I was a terrible student because I couldn't focus on things. And I had terrible time management. Uh, I, I think I had a C average graduating high school. And uh, my family wasn't super well off, so I didn't really have a lot of options. And uh, one day, uh, kind of in line with this, a recruiter came up to me and he was like, hey, do you want to skip a day of school? And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, please. What do I got to do? Sign me up. And so he, uh, he, he, he said, well, all you got to do is take a test 
and then uh, that'll take a couple hours in the morning, and then you have the rest of the day off. And I was like, let's do this. Well, I didn't realize he was going to be at my house at 6 in the morning, so it already kind of felt like I got the short end of the stick when he showed up. Uh, we drove down. I did uh, the ASVAB test, so it's kind of a, a, a test to measure your uh, overall uh, attributes towards military careers. And then when he got done, he was like, oh, you're smart. And I was like, am I? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, yeah. He's like, you can do whatever you want to in the military. And so I was like, that sounds kind of interesting. And I, and I thought about it, and I happened to hang out with my friend. He's a friend from high school named Wally. And we walked into um, his house, and we'd, we'd been doing something that we weren't supposed to be doing, I'm sure. And his, and his grandpa was like, hey, what were you doing? And then Wally was like, oh, we were just playing hockey. And he was like, no, you weren't. And then, uh, he, and, then I was, and then he started pointing out like little like intricate details about all the problems with our story. And I was like, and then when we left, Wally was like, I hate that. And I was like, he was like, my, my uh, grandpa was a veteran and he was, a, he was a, a counterintelligence operative. He knows everything that I do all the time. And I was like, well, that sounds interesting. And, and since I had the offer on the table, uh, I, joined the, I joined the army not long afterwards. And, and so while I was in the military, uh, I, uh, I ended up becoming a voice intercept operator. And so what that means is I went to, uh, I, got, I got the fortune to go to uh, Monterey, California for a year uh, as part of the Defense Language Institute. And up to that point, it had no ability to focus on anything. And now my job was to learn Korean. And so uh, I, uh, it was the first time I ever knuckled down and studied in my life. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I got good enough at Korean language to, to make it through the program. And then uh, I started the, the next levels of training where I got to go to uh, Korea eventually, spent a year in Korea. And then I ended up at uh, Fort Campbell as part of the 101st Airborne Division, where I went to Air Assault School, uh, the primary leadership development course, and, and also uh, became a combat lifesaver. So that was uh, quite a different set of experiences. And when I got out of the military, I was very happy with it, almost re-enlisted. Uh, but then I really wanted the opportunity to actually go to college. And so the whole time growing up, my, uh, my dad, um, I think his highest level of education, I want to say, was the eighth grade. <laughs> so yeah. And then my mom was uh, just from, at the time, just a high school graduate. And, uh, eventually went on to, to get her bachelor's in the evenings and stuff. So um, she was very adamant that I go to college. And so the military provided the GI benefit, which at the time seemed great. It was $30,000, uh, which I thought was a lot of money. Turns out it's not. <laughs> but, but at the time, I thought it was a whole lot of money. And, uh, and so I, I started off, I, I got out of the military, and uh, I went to community college. And, and I started with the plan of just doing the fastest degree that I could. So I was planning on taking a route through business uh, so that I could uh, do contract work for the government, because you needed a bachelor's degree to do the sort of contract work that I needed. And uh, I had all the connections that I needed, all the training, and, and the pay was excellent. And so uh, I, the, the only problem was I hated business classes. And, uh, and I, I was so bored. But then when I would take my STEM classes, I, I would perk up. And so I, I realized that uh, I kind of liked math. Uh, I, I really like chemistry. And so I was uh, planning on doing an emphasis in chemistry for an associate's degree and then, uh, and then transfer to a, a bachelor's school. But they, the class that I needed next, they weren't offering it because no one else wanted to take it. And so it was going to be another year before I, I could take it. I, was, I didn't have the patience for it, so I just quit community college, and then uh, I started up at St. Louis University. And so while I was at St. Louis University, um, I got really fortunate in that uh, Cecil Thomas, who had been at Case Western Reserve University, was one of their founding members. At the time, it was the t ranked in the top five engineering programs in the country, started the new BME program at St. Louis University, mirroring Case's program. And he hired excellent faculty. A lot of them have gone on to become heads and chairs of programs all across the country. So at the time, it was this real locus of, of high quality teachers. And the, the, the program itself was just a bachelor's level program. So these were absolute experts in the field who were just 100% focused on our education. And so I learned a lot. And, and I, um, I got the opportunity to do research with a number of different people. Uh, and it wasn't like research that I often see in uh, these bigger research institutes. Uh, I was treated as a grad student. And so when I came in and started the project, I was expected to do the research. I was expected, my expectations were very, very high. 
and it, and it was all volunteer work, so I didn't get paid for it. But, uh, and, and so uh, we, we won a couple of awards with some of the projects that I, I got there, and I realized that I really liked doing research. And so uh, I, I, uh, at the time I met my wife, uh, my, now she's now my wife, but uh, we started dating my uh, wife when I was at St. Louis University, and we hit a crossroads. She uh, found her dream position at Case Western Reserve University, whereas I found my ideal research position at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So I naively thought, why as well just uh, roll with this and uh, let's, uh, we're gonna not let our, our you know, feelings for each other affect our, our career choices. Well, that was a terrible decision. And uh, I was miserable and I was driving back and forth between uh, <laughs> Troy, New York and Cleveland, Ohio through the dead of winter every year. And so uh, what I ultimately ended up doing was uh, leaving <laughs> Rensselaer and, and going to Case where uh, I got to work with Agata Exner, who um, was a wonderful, wonderful research advisor. And what she really did was uh, she really pushed me. And so uh, by the time I graduated at Case, I had 12 uh, manuscripts, uh, or 12 different publications, and she thought I would be a very competitive applicant for the Department of Defense Breast Cancer Research Fellowship. And at the time, um, I didn't, I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself, but I went ahead and applied. And uh, so I ended up being one of three recipients for that award. And uh, it allowed me to, uh, and then while I was doing this, I, I kind of reached back out to Jan Stegman, who is my master's advisor. And I, and I asked him, so with postdoc awards, what's the, what's the role here? What can we do? And he said, what you want to do is think about your brand and what are the skills and techniques that you're missing uh, from your PhD that you should grow if you're gonna do this primary research advisor, uh, advisor role. And that's where uh, I ended up going to University of Michigan where I got the opportunity to work in a very big lab where Agata's lab is very small, so I kind of got to learn how to manage and, and do these sort of things. And the benefit of this whole program was that I got to look at this five years, uh, I got to look at breast cancer as a focus, and a part of it was writing up like what my overall career plan was. And so what I got to do was think about this in terms of how can I make a difference and how can I help? And so what I started to do was think about things in terms of metastasis. At the time, there was no one looking at metastatic research, and, and the tools that they had available were non-existent. And so I, I thought, I can make a difference here. And so what we started to do was really kind of dive into the different hallmarks of metastasis over the course of our research, apply our chemistry background with our understanding of, of general physics. Uh, and what it did is it allowed us to, to create a, a few different high impact papers, really kind of uh, understanding the ability of tumors to modulate the different microenvironment. And so it, it, we, we started to develop tools. Uh, again, working with Mike Wint, we, we kind of identified some different proteins and pathways and uh, develop some novel approaches for creating very higher order structures, much more similar to tissues than what you would see normally. And what this allowed us to do was to start some really cool projects with collaborators here at Purdue, where we could create these uh, mimetic tissues to really study this disease. And so uh, we, through this, we've identified a number of different pathways uh, that allow us to understand kind of those true underpinnings in biology uh, that are going on during metastasis and, and really understand what is happening when tissues uh, take on these invading cells and uh, in that understand what it is that's changing within these tissues that allow these cells to grow and expand. And so with that, we kind of flew through the science, but uh, uh, what I, I obviously need to acknowledge is our funding sources. And so uh, as Jungin mentioned, we've been fortunate to be pretty well funded throughout our, my career. Uh, things started with the Department of Defense uh, while I was here. The first grant I got was the Mark Foundation that allowed us to do some precision medicine testing. Uh, we got to the Catherine Peachy Foundation to start to look at uh, effects of motion and, and actual uh, the role that, that tissue movement has. Uh, we have Metaviver that allowed us to continue that work as well as funds from uh, NCATS, uh, NCI, uh, NIBIB, and the NSF. So with that, I think I will open it up for questions. Close to the end, so let's uh, start with some 
Uh, interesting questions. All right. <laughs> you have uh, certainly excellent mentors here at Purdue. And yeah, maybe David Umlis is uh, fortunate. A little questionable. Uh, fortunate. A little <laughs> questionable on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but Kim Nam Kim is a really good mentor. Yeah. Uh, did he ever mentor you over some uh, Korean spritz or whiskey? There has been a number of uh, uh, meetings that involve soju, for sure. <laughs> He has made me earn my rank as a boilermaker. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we don't uh, have a true boilermakers in our. You are the true boilermaker. Well, Kinam definitely <laughs> is. <laughs> oh yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit? to how you started out with more foundational funding and what led you to search for that and how did that help you build the blocks to go for the bigger grants? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, I had, so I actually got pretty lucky when I first, um, which I feel like is the hallmark of my entire career, but uh, what I, I went to a conference, a, a Gordon Research Conference, and I happened to meet um, a person who, we were showing that some of our, our environments were very, very good at, at, at uh, allowing primary metastatic patient cells to grow and expand for drug testing. And there was a, a partner that, or a, 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 a colleague that I ended up meeting named Wil, uh, uh, Wilbert Zwart in Netherlands, who uh, happened to be in close contact with this foundation, the Mark Foundation. And he was like, hey, we, we have these tools that we have have in place to study uh, drug sensitivity of metastatic cancer cells. And because we're part of the only, the, Na the Netherlands Cancer Institute, it's the only cancer foundation in the Netherlands, uh, we have access to near infinite number of patient samples. Can we t use your devices and test the samples to figure out what's going on? And, and so uh, we set up a partnership, MTA, and then I started sending samples to him, and then I ended up having the opportunity to send some students over there to teach them how to do things. Uh, uh, we were planning on having them send students to us. COVID happened, so that kind of uh, nixed that. But that really started a lot of the work. Uh, we were able to actually get close, so now we're hopeful to go into a phase, uh, phase one clinical trial with those devices in the Netherlands. So that's uh, so what we're moving towards now. Okay, I have a question actually. I'm an um, uh, NCI uh, trained cancer researcher, and then I decide to leave the field because it's <laughs> so competitive. And there's so, cancer is really complex. As people study more, I think the, uh, the, the answer they, they get is, oh, cancer is more complex than uh, we thought. So how would you kind of navigate this competitive and also complex uh, the research communities in um, you know, the field? So one is uh, make friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that helps because uh, you, you can't know it all. And so you have to create colleagues that are experts in the areas that you're not. And so and recognizing what you know and what you don't know, I think, is very key for that. Uh, the other kind of big, big part of that is to it's going to sound counterintuitive, is to dumb it down. So uh, what, I, what I found is when you start to show the very most cutting edge of research that you're doing and your newest findings, people don't know how to take it. Mm -hmm. and, and stuff that I was proposing when I first got hired, people said I was crazy for. And then now that it's been several years, people are now saying that it's commonplace knowledge that all this stuff that we were saying forever ago uh, it was happening. And so what, it, what I found is that you have to, wherever you're at, at the, when you're at the very cutting edge, take it back a couple levels so that you're at the, you assume that they have not read the, up, the most up-to-date up nature paper. Assume that they haven't read. Assume that they're at like cancer research level with their reading. And, and, and kind of go with where the bulk of people are interested, but then try and be just a little, like, because you know what's coming, mm -hmm. just take that, like, guide them mm -hmm. into your thought process, but don't hit them over the head with it, because <laughs> if not, they don't believe you. And then, and then a few years later, they're, they're like, everyone knows this, <laughs> even though no one did <laughs> at the time. Yeah, back to your veteran status. Oh, yes. Thank you very much for Absolutely. your service to the country. Uh, happy to. That was a wonderful experience. So, so okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this uh, celebration. Uh, let's uh, congrats.
all the new associate professors again.